Earthquakes are the result of uncontrollable geologic forces. Their effects can range from gentle, even unnoticed motions, to devastating and violent ground shaking. Few of us have experienced such shaking, but we have all heard news reports of the damage that results from ground motion or secondary phenomena such as liquefaction or triggered tsunamis. The science of seismology has begun to answer some fundamental questions about these events. Why do we have earthquakes? How do earthquakes and related phenomena happen? What causes the ground to shake? And how do we measure earthquakes? To address these questions, we'll take a look at the roles of plate tectonics, mechanics, seismic waves, and magnitude and intensity. To understand why we have earthquakes, we need to step back for a big picture view of the entire Earth as a system. To understand the role of plate tectonics in the system, we can divide the Earth into four main compositional layers, the crust, mantle, outer core, and inner core. Convection currents are generated as part of the Earth's cooling process, with heat rising and escaping to the surface and cold material sinking. The Earth's solid inner core spins slowly, cools, and radiates heat. The liquid outer core convects, generating the Earth's magnetic field and transferring heat to the mantle. Convection of the mantle is driven by cooling forces from above and heating from below. Heat is produced from within by the decay of radioactive elements. A rigid cooled outer layer of the Earth, consisting of the crust on top of a thicker layer of stiff cooler mantle, forms what we call the lithosphere. The convection currents exert push and pull forces that break the lithosphere into mobile sections we refer to as tectonic plates. Earthquakes rupture the active boundaries of these plates as they grind past, under, and away from each other. This simulation shows the last 200 million years of global plate tectonic motions. Notice how the plates break apart and move about eventually arranging themselves into the continents as we recognize them today. At transform boundaries, plates slide past one another and form strike-slip faults. At convergent boundaries, continents collide and form mountains, or one plate slides beneath another and forms a subduction zone. At divergent plate boundaries, plates move apart and form rifts within continents, or mid-ocean ridge spreading centers in the oceans. To understand how earthquakes happen, we must examine the mechanics of the forces and motions affecting plates and their interactions with one another. You are viewing two oceanic plates moving away from a spreading center. In cross-section, we can better see the convergence of plates at subduction zones and the divergence of plates at a mid-ocean spreading ridge or a rift valley. Although the plate motions are generally smooth, the mechanics of earthquakes arises from the friction at the plate boundaries. Faults held by this friction remain stuck for long periods of time and then suddenly break in major earthquakes. There are three main types of faults that are associated with the three types of plate boundaries. Normal faults are generally found in divergent plate boundary zones, where the plates are pulling apart from one another due to extensional forces. They release less energy or cause the weakest shaking of all the fault types. Thrust or reverse faults are generally found in convergent plate boundary zones, where plates collide with one another and experience compressional forces. These faults cause the largest earthquakes. Strike-slip faults are generally found in transform zones, where the tectonic plates slide horizontally past each other, creating parallel shear forces. The San Andreas Fault is an example of a strike-slip fault. If a subduction zone earthquake occurs along an underwater thrust fault, the associated uplift can displace a huge volume of water. The resulting wave is known as a tsunami. Earthquakes on any type of fault follow a similar pattern. When the stress reaches the breaking point on a fault, a rupture begins at the hypocenter and continues to break along the fault surface. The epicenter is the geographic location at the surface of the Earth directly above the hypocenter. To grasp what causes the ground to shake, we need to understand the propagation of seismic waves. 
Just as throwing a rock into a pond causes radiating ripples, rupturing of a fault in an earthquake causes a transmission of energy in the form of seismic waves traveling away from the hypocenter and epicenter. Earthquakes produce many types of seismic waves. Body waves travel through the Earth, and surface waves travel along the Earth's surface. It is the arrival of seismic waves that people feel when they experience shaking in an earthquake. Body waves can be broadly classified in two categories. The P wave, or primary wave, is a compressional body wave that alternately compresses and expands the particles that it moves through within the Earth. P waves can pass through any medium, and so travel through every layer of the Earth, and even the air, like sound waves. The S wave, or secondary wave, is a body wave that travels through the interior of the Earth with a shearing motion. S waves cannot travel through liquids, including the Earth's liquid outer core. There are likewise two kinds of surface waves. Rayleigh waves have energy that causes the ground to roll up and down, like water waves on the ocean. Love waves move the ground from side to side and are similar to shear waves, but can have larger amplitudes. Seismic waves carry the energy from the earthquake source to the surface where people can feel the shaking. Methods for measuring earthquakes quantify earthquakes and their effects. The magnitude scale measures the size of different earthquakes, independent of where the seismic waves were recorded. The larger the magnitude, the larger the offset, and the area of fault that moved in the earthquake. Also, for large earthquakes, the shaking is stronger and lasts for a longer time than for small ones. Each whole number step in earthquake magnitude represents an increase in amplitude of ground motion by a factor of 10. In a magnitude 6 earthquake, for instance, the ground shakes 10 times as much as in a magnitude 5. And in a magnitude 8, the ground shakes a thousand times stronger than in a magnitude 5. In terms of energy, the increase is even greater, with each step in magnitude having approximately 32 times the energy of the previous. For instance, a magnitude 6 releases about 32 times the energy of a magnitude 5, and a magnitude 8 releases around 32,000 times the energy of a magnitude 5. There is no upper limit on magnitude. However, the largest recorded earthquake in history was a magnitude 9.5. Earthquake magnitude does not vary from place to place, but is a characteristic of the total energy released by a particular earthquake. It is also helpful to use an intensity scale to quantify ground shaking due to the earthquake. The shaking intensity can vary depending upon distance from the hypocenter and local geology and is a better measure for assessing damage risk. This is the shake map for the magnitude 6.7 Northridge earthquake, which occurred on January 17, 1994. The areas that experienced strongest shaking are in warm colors like red, versus areas of mild shaking in cooler colors like blue and green. Ground shaking recorded by seismic sensors is used to make the shake map. We can also make subjective intensity maps based on reports from local people from each area through online resources like the Did You Feel It USGS webpage. We have earthquakes because tectonic plates grind past, under, and away from each other and generate earthquakes at their active boundaries. Through seismological research, we can better understand and measure the seismic waves traveling from earthquake sources that cause ground shaking and potentially preventable damage. As much as we know about earthquakes, there is still much more to learn through continued earthquake research. <laughs>